My name is Jamie Elbers. I'm, I'm Grower Sector Specialist with Canadian Nursery Landscape Association, and I'll, I'll be co-host of this webinar. Now, there are really two parts to the, the presentation today. Cassie Russell will be um, really giving the bulk of it and, and uh, showing you what you really need to know and, and look for uh, to identify spotted lanternfly and, um, and hopefully keep it out of your nursery. And, um, and then I'll give a, a short uh, presentation towards the end on uh, what CNLA has been doing, its involvement with spotted lanternfly. Um, I'll touch on the, the, the current regulatory environment in, in Canada and, and in the US and uh, talk about the clean plant certification module that we're developing for spotted lanternfly. Uh, we will have time at the end for questions and answers. Um, so if you do have questions, um, please uh, put them in the chat and in the question and answer uh, box and, and we, will, uh, we will address them all at the end. Um, so anyway, without uh, further ado, I'm going to uh, let Cassie introduce herself. All right, so uh, thanks again for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Cassie Russell. Uh, I'm the new nursery and landscape specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. I've been in this position since November, so still um, probably a new face to some of you. Before I start today, um, I just want to acknowledge that by no means am I a spotted lanternfly uh, expert. Uh, a lot of the material I'm presenting today has been compiled from a variety of sources, uh, such as the Invasive Species Center, CFIA, um, some of my OMAFA colleagues, and a lot of technical information and BMPs published by our neighbors to the south who've been dealing with spotted lanternfly for a number of years now. So I just do want to thank everyone who's been working hard behind the scenes and front lines down in the States um, on all things spotted lantern fly, just so we can try and uh, best prepare for this pest here in Canada. Okay, so before we get into it, I just wanted to touch on what I'll be covering today. So briefly, I'll touch on some key points about spotted lantern fly biology and the status of this pest in Canada and how close it is to our borders here in Ontario. Then we'll get into some things you can consider at your nursery in terms of best management practices that you can implement for prevention and monitoring. And we'll also do a deep dive, lots of photos on what to look for and when, um, as well as where to report if you suspect you've found spotted lanternfly. And just to manage expectations, this is just some things that I'm not gonna be covering today. There is a lot of fantastic research um, going on in the US uh, that I won't have time to cover. Um, I'd be happy to share some links afterwards if you did wanna dive further into any specifics for your own learning. I also will not be talking about what will happen if you find spy lanternfly at your nursery, nor will I be covering any control options for spotted lanternfly at this time. Um, so again, this presentation is just really focused on monitoring and prevention since we do not have um, any detected spotted lanternfly in Ontario or Canada yet. So starting off with some very basic biology. Uh, first I'll note, I'll likely prefer to spotted lanternfly a lot as SLF in this presentation. Uh, so SLF is a hemipteran or true bug, uh, specifically in the family of plant hoppers. So that means its biology is, is quite similar to insects like leaf hoppers and other um, piercing sucking insects like aphids that have needle-like mouth parts that they stick into plant tissue to suck up all the juices. Uh, so SLF is an invasive insect native to Southeast Asia. It was first, um, the first North American detection of SLF was in Pennsylvania in 2014. And they suspected likely arrived on stone shipments in 2012 and then started to establish from there until it was detected a couple years later. So this pest poses a major threat to both the agricultural and forestry industries. And this is because it can kill grapevines, trees of heaven, and some other saplings. And for the plants it feeds on but doesn't necessarily kill, it is a major plant stressor with a very, very large host range. It's also a big trade concern, um, and once established, um, it becomes a major public nuisance pest for the general public, um, as they've seen in Pennsylvania and surrounding areas. As of 2018, it was added to Canada's regulated pest list, and again, there are currently no known populations of spy lantern fly in Canada or Ontario. Um, it could very well be here already, and we just haven't found it. Hopefully, that's not the case, um, but again, to our knowledge, it's not here yet. Okay, so we keep saying it's not here yet, but it is likely to be here soon because, um, well, it's knocking on our doorstep and not just the front door, but the side door and the basement window. Really, it's just coming at us from a few different directions. So we have to be, uh, we have to be paying close attention. 
So since 2014, it has spread from its initial detection in um, Berks County, Pennsylvania, and is now found in uh, 14 states. And the blue shading on the map indicates co uh, counties with established populations. So I did want to highlight three specific populations here um, that are very close to us in Ontario. So starting off with this Michigan population that was uh, suspected to have originated from imported nursery stock and has since established there in Oakland County. On the other side of southern Ontario, we have this buffalo find, which is incredibly close to the Niagara border. Um, it's just adjacent to a rail yard. Um, you can actually go onto iNaturalist and see the location of this um, population on the map and see the insects, put photos of the insect in the landscape. Um, and then we're also paying attention to this population in Ohio, just across the lake. Um, this population was found by a tree care professional um, and further investigation revealed that there were more um, spotted lanternfly detected nearby with a railroad line connecting the detections. So as I've mentioned, uh, we don't have spotted lanternfly in Canada, but um, so why should you be using BMPs at your nursery? Um, BMPs being short for best management practices. Ultimately, our goal here is to reduce the risk of importation, spread and establishment of this pest, both in the province and, and Canada as a whole. Um, so we can do that through BMPs and they do work. Uh, multiple nurseries in the US and states outside of quarantine zones have been using BMPs to detect and intercept spotted lanternfly on imported nursery stock. So in New Hampshire, one nursery alone, um, reported through their own inspection program that they intercepted over 50 viable egg masses just in 2021 coming in on nursery stock and um, SLF interceptions on nursery stock um, coming into New Hampshire have occurred every year since 2020 and there have already been interceptions this year in 2023. And if you haven't already, I would really encourage you to check out the webinar that New Hampshire put on. Um, I've just included a screen grab from that webinar here on the right. Um, they've shared a lot of great information on what's worked for them there and lessons learned. Uh, so yeah, just a great resource and examples of why BMPs are important and how they can work. Ultimately, my main message here is prevention is the key. Using BMPs to prevent uh, the introduction of this pest is really the most critical step you can take. So we're gonna get into how you can start to think about doing this at your operation. Usually when we think of best management practices, we have these main pillars of prevention, scouting, reporting, and response. Since we don't have spotted lanternfly yet, the majority of our BMPs are gonna be really focused on that prevention and scouting aspects. So over the next few slides, we're gonna walk through the following steps. Firstly, identifying potential pathways. Secondly, developing a scouting or monitoring plan for your operation that covers different areas, such as incoming shipments, your surrounding landscape and high other high traffic areas, and of course, your own nursery stock. And then we will touch on the importance of staff training and communication and the allocation of responsibilities, and finally, reporting. Okay, so let's talk briefly about this first step, which is identifying potential pathways with a big focus on how SLF can possibly in be introduced into your operation. So shipments have been flagged as a very likely pathway for introduction of spotted lanternfly, um, as human assisted spread has been seen a lot in the US. Um, so I did throw up this slide to just get you thinking um, and see if you're asking the right questions of your suppliers, clients, et cetera. So if you have shipments coming to your nursery, do you know exactly where they're coming from? Are you importing stock that um, has either originated or passed through any of those states we mentioned earlier that have established SLF populations? Does the exporting nursery have an SLF program or uh, sorry, prevention program in place? Um, it's really good to just have this open dialogue with your suppliers or transport companies about SLF inspec um, inspections. And if they've been trained or educated on SLF and hold appropriate trucking permits to move through, through quarantine zones. And it's also good not to just corner yourself into thinking about your nursery stock. Also think about other shipments and materials. So if you're importing pots or machinery um, or other equipment that's coming from or passing through areas with established F SLF, you should be flagging those uh, shipments to make sure you do a quick visual inspection when it arrives, so you're confident you're not introducing this pest accidentally into your operation. Essentially, don't always trust what's declared on the paper. 
um, actually have these discussions with your contacts about what they're doing to prevent and monitor for SLF um, and verify wherever you can with your own eyes that it, uh, any sort of shipments are um, SLF free. So for those not aware, I did mention permits uh, just in the last slide. There is actually a trucking permit required to those entering SLF quarantine zones. Um, your brokers will likely have a lot more information on this than I do. Um, so it's a program delivered by Penn State Extension and Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. They have a self-paced training program where one person from the organization can do the training and then pass on the training to the rest of their staff. Um, essentially, if a truck stops in a quarantine zone for any purpose, including even taking a rest break, drivers must obtain uh, this training to get an SLF permit. So um, all surrounding states have been recognizing and enforcing this permit with truck stops. And in Ontario, there is awareness of this program. Um, I believe if you go online, you can actually see a list of individual businesses that have these permits, including any businesses from Ontario. Um, and I believe last night, one of my colleagues checked, we have about 400 businesses registered um, for Ontario. So, um, and most of which are trucking companies. Okay, let's get into developing a scouting and monitoring plan for your operations. So I know this slide is a little text heavy, but I tried to fit all the key aspects into just one slide so we could see it all at a glance and you could use it to refer back to later. So again, scouting will be your best defense for preventing this pest at your operations. So firstly, who should be scouting? That's a question I get a lot. Um, so any staff can be an extra set of eyes, but it's not the same thing as having a dedicated scout. You should have a dedicated SLF scout who spends time each week focusing solely on spotted lanternfly specific scouting activities that are outside your normal crop scouting routine. And that person can also act as um, kind of a coordinator or contact person for SLF at your operation. So that person or persons can be in charge of record keeping, uh, training and reminding other staff what stages they should be looking for during their day-to-day -day activities, uh, et cetera. Next, where should you be looking? So we will go into these in a, a little bit later in some more detail, um, but I've kind of identified three areas where you should focus your scouting. So this includes inspecting shipments as they arrive, inspecting your surroundings. So this includes things like your hedgerows or windbreaks, um, knowing if you have wild hosts on your property or on the edges of any of your fields uh, or greenhouses. And of course, uh, scouting your actual nursery stock. And how often should you scout? Uh, so New Hampshire has had great success having dedicated one to two people inspecting any incoming shipment. So that would obviously be an activity that's done as needed. Um, if you already have a CFIA inspector coming in to inspect something that's come through uh, states, you know, you can always have an additional one of your staff complement that scouting of imports. Um, for scouting your crop and surroundings, um, my recommendation would be to allocate dedicated time to that at a minimum of once per week through the season. And that again, is a dedicated person that are doing activities that are not just part of the day-to-day -day activities. And of course, um, how do you scout? Uh, big, great, great big question. Um, not something I could fit on one slide. Uh, so we're gonna cover that in the next little bit. All right, so we'll get into the meat and potatoes of uh, the presentation and go through what to look for and identifying different life stages of SLF and lots of photos. Okay, personally, I always find it helpful to remind ourselves of the past life cycle. Um, and I like to do that by looking at kind of scouting calendars to see what the stages are present when. So spy lanternfly has one generation per year, so it's pretty straightforward compared to some other pests. Um, so on the right, we've got a list of months and the life stage is most likely present at that time based on what's been seen in the US. So egg masses typically seen from October to May. Nymphs can be as early as April and go into August. And adults um, can be seen again as early as July, but most commonly are seen in August and September. And they can be present all the way up until a killing frost. And then egg laying is usually initiated around the fall equinox and then the whole process starts all over again. And this is just another version of a scouting calendar I threw out for those of us who need to see it a different way. Um, this will be incorporated into some handouts I send, I send around after the presentation just for uh, folks to reference. So let's start by reviewing each of the life cycles in a bit more detail, uh, starting with egg masses. So egg masses are laid through the fall. 
Um, again, they believe that lay egg laying is initiated by the fall equinox. And this is the life stage that can um, overwinter and hatch happens in the spring. So egg masses usually have anywhere from 30 to 50 eggs and they're laid in these parallel vertical lines, um, roughly an inch long. Eggs are usually covered in like a mud-like waxy coating. I kind of think that looks a little bit like putty. Um, and it dries up over time, cracks and can wear or fall off. Eggs can be laid on any surface. Um, they really do seem to like um, laying their eggs on rough protected surfaces that are out of direct sun. Um, but SLF are incredibly opportunistic um, when they can't lay um, on their preferred hosts. They will lay on anything like tree trunks, lawn furniture, stone, posts, sidings, pallets, etc. Um, and these egg masses can be found at any height. Again, a lot of the times on the trunks and branches of preferred host trees. When egg masses start to hatch, holes can usually be seen, um, especially if the coating's gone. Um, so like the bottom middle photo there, um, an important piece, you can kind of see some of the holes um, from the, the eggs that have hatched. An important thing to know about egg masses is simply scraping them onto the ground won't kill them. I'm sure we're all familiar with about that with, with uh, spongy moth. Um, same sort of concept here. You need to make sure you're popping them or scraping them into a vessel or baggie where you can collect them or use some sort of alcohol uh, to kill them. So uh, if you are in a situation where you are scraping eggs, hopefully you aren't in that situation anytime soon, make sure you get all of them. Sometimes it can be a two person job just to make sure none are missed. Oh, and they're just uh, highlighting some of the egg masses on those uh, materials there. Okay, so just some more photos for reference. On the left, we can see some of those rows of eggs, those vertical rows I was talking about. Um, and there, the majority of that egg mass is covered with that mud-like coating uh, that's just starting to crack. On the top right, uh, that's a very fresh egg mass, so it still looks almost wet and putty-like, um, a little bit waxy. And uh, just some other records photos here too, showing uh, different locations these eggs, egg masses can show up. And more examples, these are a little bit more about the, the interesting places that egg masses has, have been found and are some photos from Pennsylvania. So we have examples of spiral interfly laying eggs on posts, um, really thin limbs, um, vines, uh, rusty surfaces like that barrel there. Um, and they even found um, one egg mouse uh, on a Christmas tree or inside a Christmas tree. This is quite unlikely since spotted lanternfly don't tend to uh, like conifers. Um, but it really just shows us that in the absence of their preferred host, they really can just lay their eggs on anything and be quite opportunistic. And just some things to make sure you don't confuse with spotted lanternfly egg masses. Um, most commonly confused are spongy moth, aka uh, gypsy moth egg masses. So there on the left side is a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. So SLFs on the left and spongy moth on the right. And you can notice the different appearance of texture and color. Some folks have also found praying mantis uh, upicas or egg sacs that have been misreported as spotted lanternfly egg mass. So that's an example there of that in the middle. Um, and egg masses can also be easily confused with clumps of dirt, mud, sometimes even lichen growing on tree limbs. Okay, so moving on to the next stage, we have the early nymphs. So this is the first to third instars. Uh, they're typically present from May to July. Um, and they are small, about the size of a tick, um, and they can be quite difficult to see and find. They're black with white spots, um, which is pretty distinguished, but, uh, and they don't fly. But they are strong jumpers, um, and they have sticky feet, which allows them to stick to vehicles traveling at high speeds and just makes them um, good hitchhikers. They feed a lot um, and move almost constantly on nearly everything. They have a really large host range and really love tender um, young shoots. Um, like most stages, they do prefer grapes, tree of heaven, and walnut, but they'll also um, feed readily on things like butternut, willow, birch, sumac, roses, and other tender herbaceous perennials. Now, while they are small, the nymphs are capable of killing seedlings um, in high numbers, and limbs of full size, sorry, limbs of full size trees, again, if they are in high enough populations. Moving on to the late nymphs or fourth instars, um, this is when we start to see this red color develop. 
they are still black with white spots, but the, they now have these distinct red patches. So they're most commonly encountered between July and August. Um, it's also the stage, which is right before they turn to adults. Um, so they tend to move more towards woody hosts and mature trees and will cluster together, especially on those main preferred hosts again, which are tree of heaven, grapes and walnut. Since there are nymphs, um, again, they, they can't fly yet, um, but they can still jump and crawl up and down plants quite easily. And because of their coloring, there are some commonly encountered lookalikes. Um, so we have spiraling and fly on the left, which has those distinct white spots. You'll notice with some of these other confusing insects, so box elder bugs, milkweed bugs, and European fire bugs, those are all just red and black without those white spots. So that's a good giveaway or key uh, differentiator. There's also been um, some stink bugs mistaken for spotted lantern fly. Um, those can sometimes be a little trickier. So it's always best to just check with someone if you're not sure. And lastly, uh, we have the adult stage, which is the most reported stage and quite easily identified um, as it's quite large and showy. So adults are, are present usually starting in August um, and until a hard frost. They can uh, still hop and crawl, but can now also fly because they do have wings. Um, so it makes them even better hitchhikers. They produce and secrete honeydew on their areas that they're feeding. So you can always use signs um, of city mold or sap collection or leakage at the trunks of the trees to know that you might have some spotted lanternfly if you look up. They tend to swarm on large trees and they're just very large and clumsy flyers. Um, so they become a, a major nuisance pest for homeowners and the general public in the US. It's important to note feeding damage from spotted lanternfly adults likely will not kill nursery stock because they do tend to gravitate more towards older trees. But it's good to remember any feeding from adults or nymphs um, for that matter is going to be a significant stressor on plants, which of course then opens them up to issues like quality reduction, reduction of cold hardiness, dieback or other plant health issues like less resistance to disease, the, the list goes on. And in case you haven't seen the extent of what adults can do, here are a couple photos um, for you from areas of high infestation in the US. Um, the picture on the left is someone's backyard. So that's pretty rough and awful. Um, and that tree is gonna have a really tough time being resilient under that much stress from feeding. So when they are feeding, you may have noticed in the last photo, they do have their wings folded up um, over their body in a kind of a triangular shape, which is very distinct for plant hoppers. Um, but if they are disturbed or in flight, that's when you see the red underwing markings. Um, and that's when some folks might confuse them for some common moths we have here in Ontario, such as tiger moths, leopard moths, and underwing moths. Again, if you are ever unsure of what you're seeing, don't hesitate to reach out to someone or send a photo to a professional um, or even send it off to the Invasive Species Center or CFIA just to get a clear confirmation that it's not spotted lanternfly. Um, there's also a lot of really great tools out there these days, like the Seek app um, or iNaturalist. They do a really great job of identifying insects um, if, they, if you do have clear photos. For SLF adults, it's good to know a little bit about their behavior um, so we can exploit that a bit to help inform scouting. So knowing these preferred hosts, again, tree of heaven, walnut, wild and cultivated grapes, those are spots where we can um, identify and make sure we check on, the regular, check on a regular basis. Adults also usually swarm on larger trees with good sap flow. Um, so those can be hot spots that you can kind of flag and recognize or potential hot spots, sorry. Uh, again, they've noticed that this pest tends to stay on the edges of treed areas or disturbed areas. Um, they're really quite opportunistic and aren't going to go deep into wood, uh, wooded areas. That's just too much work for them. Um, high traffic areas too, if you're near, near rail yards, major highways, or if you have a busy shipping and receiving yard with lots of traffic, make sure you check to see if any preferred hosts are in that area specifically. In the late fall, um, some folks in the United States have reported that trees that have not yet seen nest yet are going to um, attract the adults because they're a good indicator that those plants still have a higher sap flow. Um, so those would be good areas to keep an eye on when monitoring. And it's also important to remember, um, you're not just looking for adults. Uh, they are quite easy to notice, but also be aware of signs of feeding, um, such as the leaky sap, city mold at the base of trees or branches, um, that sort of thing. 
Oh, and uh, excess activity from wasps can also be another thing. Uh, and if you don't have shipments coming, or sorry, if you do have shipments uh, coming and going in the fall, or even have return trucks with empty loads that may have passed through those U.S. states with SLF, it's good to even consider inspecting those trucks and shipments. Um, when the adults are flying in the fall, um, they can get into uh, or hitch a ride on essentially anything. Okay, so we, I've talked a little bit about, um, I've mentioned host plants, we've talked about what to look for and when, but let's dive a little bit deeper into their host feeding preferences. So I've mentioned three of their preferred hosts a few times, again, those being grapes, tree of heaven, and walnuts. Um, but unfortunately, there are more than 70 different um, known plant host species in a four SLF in North America. So in P Pennsylvania, um, they found the most preferred hosts are those three I mentioned um, for pretty much all the, the life stages. Um, but we can't ignore that they've also been commonly found on other species. So silver and red maple, willow, sumac, styrax, oriental bittersweet, and many more. So this is just a great diagram from Iowa, Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Um, just to show you some of those top hosts, and this is by no means an extensive list. Um, so we can see here the, the younger nymphs, as I mentioned earlier, are generalist feeders and prefer tender tissue. So they can be seen on things like perennials and roses. Um, and it's when spy lanternfly go, gets more towards their late and star nymphal stage um, and adults that their preference for um, landscape hosts shifts more towards woody species. Adults in general seem to prefer old um, growth trees with significant turker pressure, which they believe allows for greater ingestion of sap. Um, and adults also have been seen to move um, to black walnut and wild grapes after Tree of Heaven starts to senesce in the fall. So we can't talk about spotted lanternfly without touching on Tree of Heaven. Um, it was once thought that this host was necessary for the past development, um, but that has since been proven untrue. They can survive solely on other plant host species, but Tree of Heaven does help their development, which is why they will um, gravitate more towards that plant if it's nearby. Tree of Heaven uh, is an invasive and regulated species in Canada, but it, it is past the point of eradication. Um, it's quite common in disturbed areas uh, along uh, rail or transport corridors um, and very well could be in your hedgerows or bordering your fields. So a really common question that's come up, is it worth removing tree of heaven? Um, and the answers to that are quite mixed. In the US, they are looking at using tree of heaven as a trap crop. Um, and I think personally, I think uh, the point we're at now in Ontario and in Canada, be just great to use it as an indicator crop so knowing where it is is quite critical if we start getting to the point with pop with having spotted lanternfly populations in ontario or canada then i could uh, see why one would absolutely want to remove this from their property if you have it um, in the meantime since it is invasive you can report it on something called edd or edmaps um, or inaturalist um, if you are so inclined you can also report it to the cfia I will say uh, for any nurseries in Ontario, though, if you do have Tree of Heaven on your property or nearby, I would love it if you reached out to me. We do have, um, with Amafra, some limited funds to set up some passive traps. Um, I'd love to put these in some helpful areas. So please reach out to me. And on the topic of traps, um, I think they are worth mentioning that there are some options out there. Initially in the US, they started using sticky bands on hot trees. Um, so trees that they noticed a lot of spotted lanternfly gravitating towards, but they did get a lot of bycatch, including birds. Um, so now the most common practice is to put these traps we call bug barriers on, which is the photo on the far right. Um, this is what we have uh, some funding to put up in some locations across Ontario. So again, if you have large walnut trees or tree of heaven at your nursery and would be willing to trap host a trap, please reach out to me. Um, and then something cool to share too, in the States, they've just been developing this um, lampshade trap, which is the bottom left photos there. Um, and this is something that they've been using to capture egg masses um, when they know they already have spotted lanternfly there so that they can uh, collect egg masses and, and bring them into the lab to do uh, tests. One thing I do wanna stress though about traps is that none of these traps have any sort of attraction component to them, like a pheromone. 
Um, therefore, this is just a passive trapping system that's only going to catch spotted lantern fly if it's already there. So this is not a replacement for active scouting. Um, it's just a way to supplement your active scouting. Okay, so now uh, we know what to look for and a bit of biology. I just wanted to revisit this question on where to focus your efforts and dive a bit more into detail on the three areas I mentioned earlier, which were inspecting shipments, inspecting your surroundings, and inspecting your crop. Some BMP recommendations <clears throat> for inspecting shipments. So if you are receiving, I won't go too much into detail, but if you are receiving shipments from SLF affected areas, um, you should be setting up a holding area separate from other stock that allows you to conduct those thorough inspections. When you're doing inspections on stock incoming between October and May, this is where you should be focusing, uh, looking up for egg masses. So this means checking tree trunks and branches, also tree crotches or other protected areas of the tree. It's best to remove and inspect trunk wraps and also play, pay close attention to pots, containers, and other associated shipping materials because as we know, eggs can be laid um, on and essentially anything. <coughs> In the US, they have reported that most interceptions of egg masses have been found on maple, styrax, river birch, or sorry, river birch, willow, and dogwood. So it'd be great to pay extra close attention to shipments with those. If you're inspecting shipments um, from May and onward to a hard frost, um, similar to the last slide, having a dedicated area where you can do thorough in, um, inspection of your shipments is critical. Um, but now instead of just looking for egg masses, you should be inspecting all plants for any life stages, including uh, any hatched egg masses and nymphs. And then from August and onward, also looking for adults. Uh, make sure you take extra care inspecting known preferred hosts that we just talked about. Um, and looked and sorry and look for signs of spotted lanternfly feeding, which could be uh, again the presence of city mold, weeping, or leaky sap from tree trunks, or unusual wasp activity. Make sure a member or members of your team thoroughly inspect all plants from that are coming from areas known to have spotted lanternfly before they are incorporated with nursery stock or offered for sale. Can't stress that. Enough. Moving away from shipments, um, here are some considerations you should keep in mind when identifying where to focus your time scouting your surroundings and fields. Firstly, do you have tree of heaven, grapes, or walnut on or near your property? Um, if you haven't already, please do go do a survey of your property and surroundings for these preferred hosts um, that can act as hot spots. Uh, so this means going and looking at hedgerows and windbreaks and forest edges that might be bordering your property, um, even shipping and receiving yards that might have host plants um, nearby or like a big, beautiful walnut tree uh, right next to the driveway. Another consideration, are any of your fields close to rail lines or major highways? So this has been a common method of spread in the U.S., so it's best if you have field or stock near transportation corridors, you pay extra close attention to those fields because they could be more at risk. Another great consideration, what's your relationship like with your neighbors? <laughs> Are they aware of spotted lanternfly and what do you think they would tell you if they did see or find something suspicious? So really great to have those conversations. And finally, when it comes to scouting fields, you should already be scouting on a regular basis for other pests and issues. Um, so looking for spotted lanternfly in your actual uh, nursery stock in those areas can be easily incorporated into a regular um, field scouting program. So all staff should be trained on what to look for and who to report to. All staff can be an extra set of eyes when doing those day-to-day -day tasks, um, but you do still need a dedicated SLF leader on your team, whatever you want to call them, uh, that has specific spy lantern fly scouting and reporting duties. With that, you can identify clear responsibilities and tasks for spy lantern fly prevention and a chain of command at your operation. So I, wanted to, I also wanted to highlight too that um, continued communication and collaboration with organizations um, and regulators such as CFIA and CNLA and us here at AMAFRA. Um, it's really great um, to keep everyone in the loop to know where their pressure points are and what concerns are arising, um, just so that we can hear what's, what those issues are that are shared among nurseries and, and work on them. I also think communicating with clients is going to be really key. Um, it's important that clients are aware of spotted lantern fly. Let them know what you are doing, um, what preventative actions you are taking, um, and provide them re with resources too if they're interested um, so they also know what to look for. 
If you do want outreach materials uh, for your staff or clients, they are available through the CFIA and Invasive Species Center. Um, you can contact either of them for ID cards to share, um, like the one picture here. They also have some great posters you can pick up um, to put up at your business. And again, I really just want to stress that the earlier we find, we or anyone finds spotted lanternfly, the easier and less costly it's going to be to manage. So we all need to be on the same page with training, communication, and sharing these messages um, so we can all work together and effectively. All right, this brings us to the last little portion. So what do you do if you find spotted lanternfly? So how to report it? As a reminder, spotted lanternfly is a regulated pest. Therefore, you must report it if you see it or you think you found it. And I know nobody wants to be the first to find it, but ultimately um, it will benefit everyone the sooner it's reported, isolated, and managed. So if you think you've spotted, spotted, spotted it, snap a photo if you can. Um, if it's an egg mass, you can carefully scrape it into a bag or container. Best to use two people to make sure you don't miss any. Um, if it's another life stage, either squish it or try and collect it if possible. Um, and of course, report it immediately. And this is how you report. So there's a couple ways. Um, you can report suspected spotted lantern fly detections. All of them get fed into the same channels. Um, so there's not one right or wrong way to do it. CFIA does have a website there with their online form. Uh, you can also contact your local or national office. You can also get in touch with the Invasive Species Center. They have a regularly checked email and telephone number that it posted there if you did want to call someone. Um, we also have those other reporting tools um, that I mentioned like EdMaps um, that are intended for invasive species tracking like Tree of Heaven. So if spotted lantern fly is uploaded to something like that or even iNaturalist, CFIA is still notified, but really uh, your best tools for reporting are going directly to the CFIA or Invasive Species Center. When you are reporting, um, make sure you collect as much information as possible. A good report is going to include multiple clear photos. Um, try to collect the specimen if possible too. You also are gonna have to include your precise location, um, what it was found on, make sure you're clear with what life stages were found and how many. Um, and if it was detected on an incoming shipment, collect as much information proactively as you can, such as where was it coming from, is it still contained? Um, the contact information for the exporting company or nursery or trekking company. Um, yeah, the more information, the better for these reports. And again, because this is a regulated pest not yet found in Canada, CFIA will be the authority on advising on next steps and directions to contain and eradicate spotted lantern fly if it is found. Okay, just wrapping up here. So um, some key takeaways from everything I've presented today. Uh, firstly, have a prevention and monitoring plan in place at your operation. It's a really critical part um, that you understand your surrounding and identify those potential pathways for introduction, and also know where to focus your scouting efforts, what to look for, and when. So again, just highlighting in the winter and spring, examining those income and shipments thoroughly for egg masses. In the summer, continuing to do that while also scouting your crops and surroundings for nymphs. And then starting around August and into December or when, it, when we get a frost, focusing your scouting for adults, especially around Tree of Heaven, Walnut, and Wild Grape. Training for all staff is critical, but make sure you do have a dedicated SLF go-to person uh, or other staff um, to think that staff know to report to and you can complete these extra prevention and monitoring tasks like inspecting your surroundings and preferred hosts that are outside of your regular day-to-day -day activities at your, at your nursery. And of course, report spotted lanternfly immediately if you suspect you found it. Ultimately, this is going to be a community pest. So let's work together to make sure we are monitoring, preventing, and reporting this pest when we find it. So if you need more information, this is just like a little highlight point of um, the kind of go-to information you should, you should be aware of. There's lots more information and lots more resources out there. Um, a lot of what I got today was um, from the Invasive Species Center page and actually right at the top of their page, you just kind of circled it there, um, is they're making it super convenient. That's a link to report it if you do find a spot of lanternfly. Penn State and um, other states, their extension offices have some fantastic resources and recorded webinars and presentations posted to YouTube. 
And um, just a reminder, if you are not already subscribed to the On Nursery Crops blog, um, I will be posting information up there. Uh, if you aren't subscribed, make sure you go to this little area here where you put your email in and hit subscribe so you can get email alerts. Um, I plan to do a post shortly with some handouts from this presentation as well as some uh, helpful links if you want to follow up on more information. And with that, uh, I think I'm handing it back over to Jamie. Thank you, Cassie. That's um, that's a lot of information. And as you as you can see, it's uh, we're um, we're able to see this pest coming, I guess, and we're not always in that situation. So a lot of the work has been done in the U.S. on on uh, spotted lanternfly, and um, we're able to to pull on all that information uh, in in a sense, be proactive. Um, from a Canadian perspective. So uh, just as a reminder, we do have uh, some questions and we'll get to those at the end. I just want to talk for about five or 10 minutes on uh, some of the things that the industry is um, is doing to uh, be proactive in, in this case. So I'll just uh, share my screen. What I do want to just touch on is uh, sort of what, what we are doing as an, uh, as an industry through, um, through Canadian Nursery Landscape Association and and the other provincial associations, Landscape Ontario and NBCNLA, of course, uh, to um, to to address uh, this, which which is really a, a large threat to the nursery sector. Um, so I'll touch on three points. Really, uh, CNLA has been actively participating in in a CFIA technical advisory committee uh, for spotted lanternfly. Um, we've also been working on the development of a, a, a plant certification program. Uh, best management practices and pest modules for spotted lantern fly. <clears throat> and we have also set up a uh, spotted lantern fly task force, um, which met for the first time a, a few weeks ago. And um, it's made up of a couple of growers from BC, Ontario, and, and, and Quebec, as well as um, Cassie uh, Russell will be sitting on that, that task force and association support from myself, Janine West from Landscape Ontario, and, um, and Corrine uh, Rogers Beresford from uh, BC LNA. Uh, the, the, the goal of that um, task force is just to be sure that we're um, dealing with um, spotted lanternfly and, and have the communication uh, with regulators there uh, in case it is found um, in a nursery in Canada. In that instance, of course, we want to make sure that nursery stock uh, continues to move safely um, and, and that that's not hindered um, and that spotted lanternfly, of course, doesn't move with that nursery stock. Um, so I'll just touch on the, the CFIA Technical Advisory Committee. Um, we're, we're big on acronyms and I, it's easier than rent, writing everything out, but the CFIA established this committee uh, about a year and a half to two years ago. And uh, there, there's a multitude of members. Um, CFIA, of course, the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association, Quebec there, it's Invasive Species Council, the Lumber Standards Association, Grape Growers of Ontario, Canadian Border Security Agency, Quebec uh, Wood Exporters, OMAFRA, BCMAF, um, and, and other agricultural uh, organizations um, across the country, as well as the Pest Management Regulatory Authority, uh, PMRA, Pest Management Regulatory Associate uh, Organization. Um, so this group meets regularly, and uh, we, we look at all the risks um, from to industry and to the country. And there's three working groups, uh, a response and treatment working group, a communications working group, and a surveillance working group. Uh, so as a, as a group, of course, we're working together to slow prevent the entry into Canada as long as possible, and just make sure that there's a plan in place for, for when spotted lantern fly eventually is detected, uh, detected here. Uh, so that leads us to the big question, you know, what what, what happens uh, when spotted lanternfly arrives in Canada? And um, the short answer is that we don't know exactly an answer to that yet. Um, but it's not that it's not being worked on, but um, CFIA did uh, did post a, um, a risk management decision document 
um, in late 2022 uh, on spotted lanternfly, where they they assessed the risk um, to to the to the country. They identified um, the high risk pathways as being the, the forestry industry logs, live logs, and um, and the nursery sector. Um, so there's. As, as Cassie mentioned, um, spotted lanternfly is a regulated pest in Canada. It has been since 2018. Um, so when it is detected, they do have to act in one way or another. And um, CFI would consider implementation of localized regulatory control measures to reduce the immediate risk of the spread if, if spotted lanternfly is detected. And um, I just want to clarify what detection means versus established populations. So a detection is just the um, identification of a, a live specimen of spotted lantern fly somewhere. Um, and it has to be positively identified, of course, by, by a CFIA approved lab. Uh, whereas an established population is in a pop is a um, there's confirmation that that um, is a reproducing population. So it's been in the in that area long enough, longer than a year, of course, to be able to uh, reproduce. And um, CFIA will approach it differently depending on what, um, what stage we are in. Um, so if it is just detected, uh, then CFIA has proposed um, and, and I should stipulate here, these are proposals, options that they are considering. They have not published a directive yet on, on what will they will do. So these are just what could happen. Um, if it is detected, they may put control measures in place that would prohibit the movement of potentially infested products out of the area where it was detected. And or they may place a quarantine on imported articles on which the pest has been detected. And most likely they'll order treatments uh, to render the pest unviable. So those are sort of short, intended to be short term, um, uh, short, short term actions that would um, deal with the detection and uh, hopefully eradicate it at that point. Um, however, if, if they determine that the population has been there for a while, it's, it's, it's reproducing, uh, then CFA would likely um, its regulatory efforts would move towards slowing the spread of the pest and, and protecting non-infested areas of Canada. So they, they offered three options if, if that were to be the case. Um, one would be to do nothing. Uh, the second would be to prohibit domestic movement of nursery stock outside of that regulated area. And the third option would be to allow domestic movement, but it would have to be under a, a CFI issued domestic movement certificate that would be, the plants would be inspected and found free from spotted lantern fly before they would be allowed to be shipped out of that, um, that area. There are other options within there, um, but the key point is that they would uh, be looking for growers to implement some sort of systems-based approach to managing spotted lantern fly in, in the case that it were established in the area where the nursery is. Um, and, and that of course, Leads me into my next topic, which is the uh, the, the development of a clean plants uh, certification program for spotted lantern fly. Um, obviously, from industry's perspective, we'd like to minimize the impacts of spotted lantern fly on on the movement of, of nursery stock around Canada and and hopefully into the U.S. Um, so uh, we have been developing a plant module, uh, pest module for. For, um, for spotted lantern fly to become part of the clean plants certification program. For those who aren't aware of clean plants, you can go to the website uh, there, but it is a industry led nursery certification program um, whose objective is to implement systems based um, uh, systems based approaches to pest management that lead to nursery products being shipped that are completely free of a regulated pest and and um, sufficiently free of, of common uh, insects and diseases. Um, Clean Plants has four, uh, three pest modules uh, in place at this point in time, one for sun oak death, one for um, boxwood blight, 
and a brand new one that just is being posted now for, for box tree moth. So our intent is to have another one for spotted lanternfly that, that growers can implement as well. And uh, the best management practices are just about done and uh, next step will be the pest module. So, so hopefully within the, the next month, those, those items are in place for spotted lanternfly as well. Um, more of a bigger overall goal is to standardize these pest modules so that they can be used uh, for growers who are using other certification programs like the CNCP and, and GCP as well. But um, that's a topic for another day. Um, anyway, that's that's sort of what I'd like to just touch on today. And uh, now I guess we can move on to our question and answer. We still have about six minutes. Um, so thank you for your time. And uh, I'll just stop sh uh, sharing my screen. Sorry, I'll stop sharing my screen now and uh, we can start looking at some of the questions in the in the chat. And the first one was, are there degree days associated with each life cycle? or each life stage. And I, do you want to yeah. expand on yeah. that, Cassie? Oh. Sure thing. Yeah, so no, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, to my knowledge, they haven't figured that out entirely yet. Um, what they have found is that, um, again, like egg laying is associated with the fall equinox instead of degree days. So it's all about um, uh, the insects making sure they reach reproductive age before that, or um, if they, yeah, reaching reproductive um, age before that happens. I yeah, again, I'm not a spotted lanternfly specialist. I know that there's a lot of great information out there, um, and I'd be happy to follow up with some more details. I can do some deep deep digging on that. But yeah, more to come, I'm sure, on on growing degree days to help. And the the second question is: there any effort to use DNA to monitor for this pest? Yes, so um, this is actually a really great, really cool technique for any of those of us who haven't uh, heard about eDNA. Um, There's a presentation at a U.S. Spotted Lanternfly Summit a few weeks ago, um, so that YouTube video is actually available. Um, to my knowledge, um, it, it, this is a technique that's on the radar of um, some other ministries. Um, I just heard a presentation, I think it was from... MNRF, and I could be wrong, um, that they are exploring using this technique, not necessarily with spotted lanternfly yet, but um, yeah, definitely there'll, there'll likely be lots more to come on using this, this technique that they're uh, they're starting to use in the States. The, the, the last question is a, a good one as well. Are there any known predators for spotted lanternfly in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. A great question too. Um, so other than, you know, your usual generalist predators like praying mantises, um, yellow jackets, wheel bugs, um, birds even, um, there aren't any specialized predators that we know of, of spotted lanternfly um, present in Ontario. There haven't really been any in the States, so we assume that similar would be here. Um, but again, they are doing a lot of work in the States to identify any sort of potential biocontrols, um, and that includes things like funguses, um, to help uh, manage spotted lanternfly populations. But uh, short answer is mm, we don't really have much. Thank you. I, I don't see any other questions, but I could expand on is that I, I, there is uh, work being done by CFIA for an emergency registration for uh, uh, a pesticide for spotted lanternfly for nursery stock for ornamental plants. Um, so that's in process at the moment, and, and we hope um, something is available uh, to nursery uh, for nursery in the event that um, uh, the pest does arrive. So um, it's not, um, again, it's another proactive move that we have to uh, thank CFIA for for taking the initiative on. We're going to end on time today, Cassie and, and Dave. So uh, uh, thank you, everyone. We really do appreciate you. Uh, we we recognize, appreciate you coming in to, uh, to listen. As, as I mentioned, this will be, uh, this will be recorded and we'll share the link to where it's uh, being posted. Uh, to all the participants here today, as, as well to the industry at large. And um, again, if, if, if you have any questions afterwards, or you're thinking of uh, uh, anything you'd, you'd like to ask, uh, Cassie and I, of course, are always available. Uh, help, help, please, uh, please reach out to us by email or, or whichever way you prefer. And um, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's let let's stay on guard, I guess. Uh, be be uh, be on the lookout, and um, let's hope no one finds it.